With the release of A Matter of Time 3, the trilogy has finally come to an end, and after a few requests, I decided to do a little behind the scenes video. But let's pump the brakes a second. A lot of you might be saying, what on earth are you talking about? And in the words of Reginald, I simply don't care, Jerry. If you haven't watched the trilogy, this video will in fact make zero sense to you, so perhaps go and watch them first. There will also be huge spoilers, so here's your warning. Anyway, let's go right back to the very beginning. Once upon a time, Channel 5 Gaming launched the Action Coaster Contest, in which we were challenged to create an action-packed cinematic experience using the medium of a coaster. As with everything I create, I always start with a script. This way, I'm essentially just writing a story and worrying about the practicality a bit later on. I'm a big fan of Doctor Who and the general theory of time travel, and it just so happens that Johnny Five Alive, the very person who would be spotlighting my creation, is also a huge time travel fan. And that was a complete coincidence, and I absolutely wasn't using that to my advantage. <clears throat> As with all time travel stories, I knew it had to involve the butterfly effect, and the idea of correcting mistakes in the past to amend the future. In the first A Matter of Time, this took the form of Reginald accidentally running over a policeman officer person, thus leading to total human annihilation. With the script written, the next step was recording the voiceover. With this I would then know how long the coaster would need to remain in each scene. The coaster I use for all three is the Launched Torque, as it offers the most versatility, in launches, drive tyres and hold sections. However, a huge problem from the very start was that maximum hold time is 10 seconds. This meant a lot of lines had to be shortened, or scenes with essential dialogue had to involve slow drive tyres as well as hold sections. Another time-consuming process was syncing the audio properly. Planet Coaster's audio playback seems to be heavily affected by frame rate, so it's genuinely impossible to make a full audio track that works flawlessly for any device. Heck, sometimes I'd run the coaster twice in a row with the same track, and one run would be out by a couple of seconds. It made zero sense and caused me a great deal of stress. This inevitably happened when Johnny spotlit a matter of time one, and why the two sequels were then only showcased as pre-recorded videos. Next, I built a very rough version of each scene, to try and get the full coaster layout and timings done as soon as possible. I was very keen to make the transition between scenes as short as I could, so this played a big part in how the coaster was laid out. Some scenes are as simple as just going from one side of a wall to the other, but others are more complex, involving going down through the ground or building fake skyboxes. Another big part of the transitions is of course the whiteouts. These were achieved using the RideCam time machine, which activates a white screen and high pass filter at exactly the right moment for a specific amount of time. The only thing left to seal the deal was the pyrotechnics. I created the signature plasma flashes for leaving, and then another for arrival occasionally followed by steam jets, implying the time travel vehicle needed a cooldown. With the practicality of the coaster complete, it was then simply time to build the scenes. The phrase only build what you need to see rings very true in a matter of time, sometimes down to the pixel. Anything at all out of frame simply doesn't exist. For each scene, I would put the coaster in whatever position had the widest shot and start building, frequently checking back to the coaster POV. It surprises a lot of people to find out I play Planko on a laptop. I know, woe is me. So piece count is always an important factor of my builds. But also, there's simply no point building what the viewer will never see. Past this point, it just came down to the details. I had plenty of time left before the deadline, so I would just keep coming back and adding more and more details to the scenes. And how did the contest go? Oh, I'm glad you asked, because I won. Not only my bracket, but the whole contest, being crowned King Coaster in the Channel 5 gaming community. And if we can get serious for a moment, I honestly have Johnny to thank for a lot of my current success. Without the exposure I received from winning the Action Coaster contest, I don't think I'd be where I am now. So, big thanks to Mr. Five Alive for all he does for the Planet Coaster community. Anyway, back to me. After the huge amount of love I received for the first one, I was quickly being asked for a sequel, and so I felt a duty to do just that. I told myself straight away I would only commit to A Matter of Time 2 if I could unequivocally say it was better than the first. Nobody wants a disappointing sequel. Just as before, I got to writing, and it was clear to me early on that I needed to up my game. This came in the form of a more complex story and more characters, this time with voices. And with that, I brought some fellow actors on board. Hello, my name's Lois Leach and I play Jeremina. Hello, my name is Andrew Pollard and I play the role of the agent. Hello, I'm Mike Hugo and I play Jerry. There were also a couple of cameos, from Knight Filtorius calling cut on the Titanic scene and Johnny Five Alive saying his iconic line, Good googly moogly! With the script written and voiceovers recorded, it was yet again time to build. This time around I was keen to try out a new technique for the transitions. Unfortunately, I think that new technique was so quick nobody even noticed it. From when we arrive in Mexico, to when the mysterious agent appears on the fountain, are actually two different scenes. 
I discovered I could hold the coaster on a 90 degree angle downward, allowing for minute movement but completely different perspective. The only problem with this is that what goes down must come back up. That's the saying, right? This is why the transition between the apocalyptic Novikov and the Pink Penguin world is slightly longer. The same effect is used to go from Pink Penguin to the Black Void, and then it does a weird old move to get back to Mexico. This was a fun new technique to play around with, but not the easiest to build when under the ground and sideways. It's, it's very rare that sequels are actually better than the originals, and I was worried that that would be the case here. But I do think you've built on the story and almost opened it up for a freaking triple part series. Oh my god, we're gonna get a trilogy, aren't we? Good googly moogly. Yes, indeed it does mean we're getting a trilogy, Johnny. However, there was a seven month gap between the second and third for the simple reason that it took that long to come up with the story. I had lengthy conversations with friends and OG fans to make sure I was creating something new and exciting whilst holding on to what everyone loved about the first two. I'd already built up the conflict with Reginald and the agent in the second one, so it was important to create some sort of conclusion to that and a nice ending to the trilogy. A critical part of A Matter of Time 3 was the reveal of Jerry going to the bad side and the scenes that followed. This was the most complex part to create and was achieved as follows. Just before the coaster gets to the hangar, Jerry is flung backwards. Sorry Jerry. This is time so that as you arrive, Jerry walks forward out of the darkness, a clear image I had from the beginning. Next, the agent speaks of making Reginald have a little sleep, followed by the screen going black. Whilst this scene is taking place, at the back of the hangar are a duplicate agent and Jerry who are also flung backwards. Sorry chaps. Whilst the screen goes black, the coaster moves backwards, then forwards again to a new hold section just past the original duo. As the screen returns to normal, we see the second two walking through the now open door. The screen goes black once again, and I use the technique from before to quickly transition to a duplicate hangar where Jerry and the agent are now up in a control booth. This by far took the longest amount of time to program, but I think works very well on a cinematic level. If you were to look up from the second hangar, you would then see the Titanic set. Very trippy indeed. There's one massive part of the A Matter of Time trilogy I'm yet to mention, and that is of course the now famous quote, Confetti please Jerry. Here we are, Confetti please Jerry. That was extremely disappointing. I've been asked for emojis, merch, and on the Channel 5 Twitch you can actually play the original quote for bits. Anyone not familiar with Twitch and bits? That means people pay real money to hear me say, Confetti please Jerry. Confetti please Jerry. Super inspiring. <laughs> it's genuinely an honour to have created something that's loved by so many, and it really does mean a lot to me. Before I go, I thought it might be fun to take a little peek at some of the hidden details and easter eggs included across the three coasters that you may or may not have picked up on. Starting with number one, in the queue you'll find a Taco Time Machine, made famous from Tacos Through Time by Taco King. If you look closely at the Novikov sign, you can see their slogan is, what's the worst that could happen? In the mall, there's a Channel 5 shop. Jerry's love of Titanic actually comes from my sister's love of the film, and was her suggestion for a scene. The whole Pink Penguin saga was created by Themeworks, and became a huge part of Channel 5 for a long time. In the second one, the three people stood in the Mexico scene are wearing the Mexican flag colours. Jerry's wedding is the only time you ever see Reginald, as he was Jerry's best man. How touching. Where to start with the third one? There are obviously many callbacks, with the Titanic, Wild West, Old London, Drag Race, 90s Nightclub, Pink Penguin Universe, and Novikov at Christmas. But on top of that, the space scene is actually modelled from the No Man's Sky space stations. In Times Square, there are references to Wix's Black Mire, the Pink Penguins, and the Good Nice Planet Coaster community. On the Titanic set, you can see a couple of doors in reference to the famous scene towards the end of the film. We briefly fly through Little Rock Ridge, a collab park I created, which you should go watch now if you haven't already. Did I set that up just for that one plug? Perhaps. But there we go, a little peek behind the curtain. I hope you found this remotely interesting and have a better understanding of how the trilogy came together. Now quick, go watch them all again now that your brain is full of behind the scenes knowledge. <laughs>